Yuma, welcome to Floriad Reimagined and to this special event of Book Club. I'm Dan Borsher and this is Let's Talk. It's great to have you along as we navigate our new normal in what has been a very unusual 2020. And here we have a very small group gathered following all the sorts of physical distancing rules, but maintaining our social connectedness with hand sanitizer and all you can imagine, because it is important that while we grapple with these conditions, we're also maintaining that connection, those things that make it uh, so important to, to be with each other, to understand what's happening around us. And there is plenty of information about how you can continue these conversations on the Floriad Australia website. I would encourage you to have a look, see if there are other events or other activities that you want to be involved in. And because we are doing this in such a different environment, we're all having to adapt to this. So I'm very grateful uh, for the audience who is here and for you joining us wherever that may be. I want to pay special tribute to the traditional custodians, the Ngunnawal people, who have maintained and nurtured the culture, the land, the sustainability for many, many tens of thousands of years that are leading to many of the topics that we're talking about and that we're re-engaging with right now in 2020. And I pay my respects to the custodians past and present and those who are following in their footsteps as well. Events like this don't happen by themselves and I'm very grateful for the support that we've had from the ACT government, uh, the National Capital Authority, also from our partners right here in this event space, Canberra Centre and National Circuit as well. So thank you all for your ongoing sponsorship and your partnership. Today, we're very lucky. We've got some of Canberra's most fascinating personalities all sitting here to have some pretty big conversations. Former political journalist, social media savant, author Lauren Dubois, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank good you very much. To, good to have you along. Sustainability warrior and ABC Breakfast host, Lish Faya. Hello, hello. Hello, Dan. Welcome to the panel. Uh, leader in sustainability, uh, sustainability entrepreneur who's delving into many of the big Big discussions about how we turn carbon into other products. Sophia Hamlin Wang, hello to you. Hello. Great to have you here. And also leader in sustainability who's uh, become one of the leading points of discussion about how we navigate what is sustainability and how do we achieve it. Dr. Kate Ringvold, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. We're also going to be looking at some of, well, a, a panel, our panellists' favourite books, those that have rung a chord and the question of of why. So without any further ado, I want to get started with Lauren, a former political journalist who I know very well from our time uh, up on the hill, yes. which probably has put you in pretty good stead for your career since, or the, the vocation of being a mum, telling those stories on social media. You picked a book today called The Far Away Tree. This is by Enid Blyton. Joe, Bessie and Fanny come to live on the edge of the enchanted woods where the trees, quote, a darker green than usual, whisper their secrets. Why this book? Um, I love that you named the children because in the original version that I had when I was a child, they were Dick and Fanny were the children in the book, um, but they have changed them ever since uh, to Joe, Bessie and Fanny. Um, I wonder why. No, Joe, Bessie and uh, Joe, Beth and Franny now. Um, <laughs> um, in a, in a, I have recently um, rediscovered these books with my children. I have a seven-year-old, a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And... Um, the Enchanted Wood and The Magic Faraway Tree were two of my absolute favourite books as a child. Um, and I was so excited to reread them. And um, I read them to my son when he was about four and he was absolutely wrapped with them. Recently tried to read them with my four-year-old daughter and she told me they were boring. Um, <laughs> I think it's because there's not a lot of pictures and it was um, taking too long to get to the point. But um, have recently um, realised that Enid Blyton... I'm not going to say she was sexist. I'm just going to say she wrote these books in a different time where the uh, traditional roles of boys and girls was very different. So I had to skim over a couple of those things like, no, no, the girls didn't have to stay home and clean. They just were helping mummy just like the boys do as well. And um, <laughs> but in terms of what I love the most about these books um, and their connection with Floriad is even as a little girl, I love the idea that gardens and woods and that nature was where magic lived and and that if you ventured you know beyond the concrete 
and into you know the darkness of the woods where maybe where the sun doesn't quite hit the ground that that's where there might be fairies and elves and sprites and trees where magical creatures lived and you know there were magical lands on the top of those trees and um and i think that's just as a child being able to escape and discover those little bits of whimsy in the garden i think is a really special gift to give to kids no, I love that. And I want to come back to, to that later on when we're having the broader discussion about social media and how that might be changing uh, what it means to be a child and yeah. how we see the world around us. Kate, you've picked the, the Woolen Way by David Pollock, described as a remarkable memoir detailing a heroic and unswerving commitment to renew the severely degraded land on Woolen, a massive pastoral property in Western Australia's southern rangelands. Why that one? Uh, I... It was two, there was two reasons. It, it's been on my list of, you know, the books that I should read. And it's also one of those books that I wanted to read, mainly because I'm a West Australian. I am deeply homesick oh. <laughs> this year because, yeah, we're probably not going to go home for Christmas. And, it, and David talks about a, a, an area, it's, it's sort of Murchison, um, deep mid kind of WA uh, and kind of east, deep east and sort of in that real middle space where there's not a lot. And he talks about Shark Bay and, and spending summers and I think they lived in or near Shark Bay for a while in his uh, kind of early youth. And I my fondest memories of growing up in WA was going up to Shark Bay. We, we lived in Perth. I was born and bred in Perth, but we would go up to Shark Bay, my uncles and my cousins, and we would camp and be pretty feral, you know, <laughs> camp on Three Bay Island, which you can't access now. We would, um, you know, fish, shoot kangaroos, eat the, the bounty of the land and have this amazing lifestyle. And, and that was sort of winter in Perth. We would go north and, and summers we would go south. And it was, it was amazing. And, and so he's talking about all of those kinds of stories. And that was a really amazing thing to read and kind of connect with and relate to. But also for me, it was the discussion around regenerative agriculture and, and talking about the way that <clears throat> Woolleen had really deteriorated and that a lot of that land in that uh, agricultural land in that area was dying. It, it was bereft of any kind of life other than the, the introduced animals. And he's really uh, taken the journey of how do we repair that and really gone back to the knowledge of First Nations people in that area, plus a much more scientific approach to mm. is this actually a weed or is it something that can be feed for cattle? Does it um, help the soil to, to keep, uh, you know, um, regenerating the soil and does it make sure that it doesn't blow away? And that's kind of the other issue that was big in that area, the kind of the degradation that's happening in the soil across all of our agricultural areas is... It, 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 is terrible and and he's really the story i think for me was really poignant because it really takes in that whole encompassing uh, journey that they went through to get from where clearly things are not well to now thriving and how they did that and also the barriers that they came up against government policy is not helping at the moment and yeah, so it was it was inspiring. It was sad. It was a bit disappointing, but it was also a bit um, a bit poignant because I you know got to hear these stories about about home and yeah, it was it was I love it mm. and I'm still I I am still going. Yeah, uh, it's one of those books I think that I I will keep referring to. And we will touch on the, that uh, debate around regeneration and, and how's the best way to make that happen. Because, of course, at the starting point, it's, mm. it's really difficult to change directions. And, yeah. and no one likes change. No, no. And, and that's probably a really good point. I think some of the issues that David has really highlighted is that we are, we're currently approaching the agricultural kind of sector with ideas that aren't really about the health and, and well-being of the soil. 
its its production and its outcome, and that's that's very rigid. It's it's reductionist and it's not helping the soil. And if we want our agricultural industry to thrive, and I, I think we probably all do, you probably need it too. But absolutely, especially right now, um, we need to we need to look at it differently. We we can't keep doing the same things. Mm. Yeah. We will definitely come back to that. I think that's going to be one of the themes that we talk about as part of the sustainability piece. Uh, Leash Spice Notes is uh, what you've picked. Ian Hempel, t- 2000. Uh, when one grows up on a herb farm and then proceeds to spend the next 30 years working in the herb and spice industry, it's easy to assume that everyone else feels as comfortable with using herbs and spices as you do. But that's not the case, is it? Why this one? I, th- I know it feels like a bit of a textbook, and it is. It's a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it appeals to me from a factual perspective. I love, but also the, um, you know, when you look inside your spice cupboard and you think of Australians and that that spice, you might have vanilla essence or imitation vanilla. (laughs) You might have um, some Italian herbs. (laughs) (laughs) And and through history, the cupboards have changed. Our Australian spice cupboards have changed. But then... To open this up, I got given it when I was one, when I was a young woman, and I just remember opening it up and thinking, "There is a world inside my cupboard, that I, and a history, and a culture, and a cuisines, and and everything wrapped up into that that little master food spice jar." <laughs> <laughs> like I, I think of, and I have look, I have got the bookmarks down. You'll be pleased to know of vanilla, a vanilla pub, <laughs> so it's almost scratch and sniff. <laughs> um, <laughs> Beautiful. And you think, like, vanilla to me is so not vanilla. Often vanilla is used as that uh, expression if something's rather beige or plain or... But vanilla is far from anything but plain. Just have a sniff of that. But, it's you know, in terms of... Nothing boring about that. Nothing boring. Nothing boring. Yeah, pass pass it along. I mean, I've got so much vanilla. Um, But the Mm. vanilla to me is is the epitome of something that's so not beige. And certainly in Floriad... I'm just drawn to looking at flowers and how they are not for us. The flowers we think are for us because we find beauty in them, but the flowers are not for us. They are for the pollinator. And the thing with vanilla, it's got a very interesting situation happening with its pollinator. Found in Mexico, as I've discovered in all of this initially, (laughs) found in Mexico, um, this little bee, this little orchid bee, goes and pollinates the one orchid flower. Now the orchid flower only flowers for about eight hours a year and if you're not there, if that bee's not there pollinating that orchid flower no vanilla bean. Wow. So, mm. and, and the, so, that, so it's very time, timely. Yeah. Now the thing is, the trick is that the vanilla orchid only offers pollen, doesn't offer nectar to the little bee, this little tiny Mexican bee and so it goes in there, lured in there and it has to lift up a flap and sneak through. It's a little bit like the ninja of the pollinators and has to just get in there and then it all happens. But um, it gets there, no nectar, drawn by the smell and the lure of that flower and then leaves. Heartbreak. It's heartbreak. No reward for all that work. I know. But then it goes on and finds another one. Here's the problem though. The, when they first moved, as I discovered, when they first went from, uh, they went, vanilla, fabulous, we will have some of that. Uh, the Spanish took it back, um, Cortez took it back to Europe and went, let's grow them. Grew for, tr- tried for centuries, could not grow vanilla. The thing missing was the little bee. Mm. And the, oh, so symbiotic, symbiotic of the two that without the little bee, the vanilla wouldn't fertilise or, or pollinate. So now they go around with a toothpick a lot less romantic, but highly labour intensive. So the vanilla, just so not vanilla, that it's the most labour intensive. I think the second most labour intensive crop. So that's why it's so expensive. Yeah. And saffron's the most labour intensive, mm-hmm. uh, but vanilla, second most labour intensive. That's why it should be, should be so expensive. That's why it has travelled the world. And so everything about vanilla is fabulous. And that's just one story <laughs> in this textbook. Oh, my goodness. Honestly, <laughs> I sit down with a cup of tea. Like even yesterday, I went and bought some seeds. Normally, you find beans and peas and all the other seeds. Bergamot was in the shop. Yes, bergamot. I went, oh, bergamot. I'm thinking Earl Grey. So that's why I bought it to make my own Earl Grey tea. Who doesn't? Get back here. You got the sweet turn, turn to bergamot. It's not Earl Grey tea flavour. Earl Grey tea comes from bergamot. Um, it's a bergamot orange. 
Oh, the Got cousin. It completely wrong. Oh. The cousin. The second cousin. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I wouldn't have known. I'm still going to grow my bergamot. If anyone wants a seedling when they come out, <laughs> you go on a giant experiment. So that's why I've <laughs> chosen this book. It's fabulous. You can see I'm quite excited by it. Yeah. I love it. And that symbiotic relationship is so important. Is I think I might have heard on your show uh, the start of this year about a type of orchid that only gets pollinated by a mosquito. Yes, yes. So <laughs> something that, that annoys us, cre- you know, is the thing, the, the bridge to something that's so beautiful. Absolutely. And this, this bee that pollinates the vanilla orchid, it can go to other flowers to get, po- uh, to get nectar. So I don't know if there's an evolutionary problem here, that the vanilla orchid is just pinning everything on a toothpick. Playing, its, playing itself out of the game. It's not giving anything back to. So anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous book, but it is a text book and mm. not much poetry in it but great recipes and great information. There's a lovely symmetry uh, about that symbiotic relationship, Sophia, the book that you've picked, which is The Botany of Desire, A Plant's Eye View of the World by Michael Pollan. Every school child learns about the mutually beneficial dance of honeybees and flowers. Perhaps it should be of vanilla. The bee collects nectar and pollen to make honey and the process spreads the flowers, genes far and wide. This book goes much further than uh, than that top level, doesn't it? It fits in perfectly with what Lish was just saying in that we think um, as humans that we've been able to domesticate all of these different uh, flowers and uh, and plants so that we can eat and enjoy. But actually, the this book um, presents a plant's eye view of the world and actually how plants have been able to appeal to different desires of humans in order for us to proliferate them. So it goes into four different um, plants that appeal to different desires and uh, it goes into uh, apple for sweetness, uh, into tulips for beauty, into marijuana for intoxication and potato for the desire for control. And it's been on my to read list for quite some time um, because it's one of Michael Pollan's very first books, but uh, I haven't had the chance to read it. And so I was really, this is such a great opportunity to get to finally sink my teeth into it. And actually it's fascinating. I just put bookmarks all the way through it because I was like, this is going to be interesting to say. This is <laughs> <laughs> The main takeouts though, I think, which are relevant to this is, well, firstly, um, Tulips and marijuana are two things that kind of Canberra are a bit known for. And so I, <laughs> I thought, I really want to get to know about <laughs> more historical reasons for why humans and those plants have um, some interactions. And tulips in particular um, were chosen for beauty because they have no other functional purpose. They're just beautiful. Um, and he goes into these the two kinds of um, aspects of beauty um, from the Greek gods of art, so Apollo and Dionysus. And uh, he makes the comment that Apollo um, appeals to the form of just um, form and beauty. So when you see a tulip that is perfectly symmetrical and bold colors, it really appeals to something in you. But then Um, The god of Dionysus appeals to extravagance and disruption. And so a lot of the very, the tulips that caused um, a lot of the upsets in uh, in the Netherlands in the um, 1500s, the the very um, valuable tulips were those that were deviated from that norm. So we're attracted to things that have form and beauty, but also that, um, that have a flair and that have extravagance and like just he he weaves um, poetry and it is kind of like a textbook because it goes into a lot of mm. um, a lot of that and if I can say one more thing um, what really what really struck me about the book is the fact that beauty and value and taboo are not really real things they're constructs that mm. we've added to things so yeah what we find beautiful might not be might be um different to another person and the value of a tulip um can be artificial in in a bubble and um i think right now 
um, in COVID-19 times, we've seen potatoes lose their value because we had an oversupply and a glut. And I just, I really enjoyed this book so much and I'm looking forward to reading it again at leisure. With <laughs> <laughs> not having a plan for today. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to lie, I did that a little bit. <laughs> I, I, really, I really loved one of the, uh, the premise of this, this book of the question of who domesticated who because mm. it throws out this, what I thought was a wild concept that was it the plants that have moulded humanity? That's right. It, it, they're saying that different plants um, exhibited the things that we desire so that we could proliferate them way more than they would have been. They, they, marijuana and apples and potatoes um, and tulips would have been just small clumps if humans were not mm. around. But we've taken them, we've been enamoured by them and we've just spread them all over the world. And so we've elevated their importance. So that's right. And so they've they've got us wrapped around their little finger. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, I, I want to get onto the kind of sustainability discussion in just a tick, but I first want to just kind of check in on this year and on how life has changed for you. What have been perhaps some of the lessons, uh, Laura? I'll start with you there. Um, you, you know. One of the things, we, Dan and I um, knew each other a long time ago and we were just mentioning we haven't caught up in a while, made me realise I don't catch up with a lot of people mm. because staying at home hasn't been that difficult. It's just the norm. But also I do have three children, so going out just doesn't really happen anyway. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think when it all started, I, I realised how resistant I was to change of, of any sort. Um, the idea that I that someone would tell me to stay home suddenly became really stressful for me, which is silly. Like it wasn't that difficult, but it it felt huge. Um, and also because, uh, okay, I'm a Canberran, so I like to whinge about stuff that affects us, but we already did the lockdown in January, I feel, because of the smoke. Mm. Um, yeah. Our house in particular, turns out, not protected from the elements at all because we literally had smoke inside our kitchen and stuff and so we were already trapped for what feels like weeks and weeks over January and then we had February which was like oh hooray and the kids went back to school and it was great and then March and it was like we only had so little time to be mm. free and happy um, and I think especially with children trying to explain to them why we can't go and do the things that they want to do um, without terrifying them and then, and then hearing them now just talk about, oh, that's because of the virus. We can't do that because of the virus. And it just seems so normal. I actually had to explain to my son the other day, this isn't normal. Mm. Like this hasn't happened in my lifetime, in, in Nanny and Papa's mm. lifetime. Like this is really, you know, this isn't how life is supposed to be just because they just are so like, oh, well, yeah, we don't get to do anything now because of the virus and everybody has to stay home because of the virus and... Do you reckon that while as adults it might have been diff more difficult for us to grapple with, that it's creating a resilience in the little people? I really hope so. Mm. Like that would be a really great, you know, benefit yeah. for it. Um, I think they just take th things like that in their stride really easily. Um, you know, at the same time, if they don't get the right plate at dinner time, shows resilience is not their strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... <laughs> But, but around, you know, social changes in the broad, like outside of the home, um, yeah, I think they, they have probably become a little bit resilient. Um, I feel like I have PTSD from doing homeschooling um, and I, my heart hurts for Victorians who've had to just keep doing it and they still are, you know, after this holiday, still have to keep doing it. That was really, really difficult. Um, it did make me feel very grateful for our teachers and us and our education system and, and the, the role that school plays in a child's life, just because they get away from mum and dad, they get to go and see their friends, they get to play. They, um, I think that was really hard for my two older kids, mm. just not being able to go to school and see their friends and yeah. They took that out on, out on me, so it was so much fun. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, those lessons have been difficult for everyone because we're all grappling with different things in different ways. But at least at the same time as doing that as an individual, you've been helping Canberra navigate through this. You're the one that we wake up with. I, well, some of you might. <laughs> some of you might. I, 
It certainly has been an interesting job to both communicate the science of it, and I am, my background is in science, and mm. I'm absolutely adamant that this is, a, this is a health problem. And then, first of all, I just wanted to make sure people understood the health implications of this. And then we came out of that the, the social implications and the economic implications, and it all folded into this giant monster that was just <laughs> moving around. I think part of my role, I discovered quite early on, wasn't necessarily necessarily all about COVID and I think we had a fatigue pretty early on COVID COVID and I remember f when it first came out and I said we've got to do something on this this is this is a big story this is this is a, I've spoken to people they've said this is a worry so and they went no 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 it's not you know I think it's just in China and so then slowly we would do a, f a few stories and then I'd get a lot of texts saying you, it's a beat up <laughs> I went, oh, okay, it might be a beat up. Yeah, they we've they got aged a, well, those two. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and listening back, it's really interesting. Uh, then, then it all unfolded. Mm. It's, it's, uh, it's been a hard one to navigate because you don't want to uh, do the over, overkill of the topic. You still have to be there for company. And I got a really lovely text early on um, just saying, Lish, it's just waking up to you at 5.30... It, it's been a bit of a salve for me. You know, I, I think we could all get pretty depressed around this, but you just got to keep the, the energy up and still realise that life is going on and there are little joys to be had. And I certainly found that just... Be, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. Um, oh. I am. Oh. <laughs> true. I'm, I'm always an introvert. Whatever. <laughs> but, but I, I, I get a lot of my energy. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of my energy from my garden yeah. and home and... Stay, and I can't say no enough. I, I, I find myself saying, y yes, but inside that's I want to say, no. That's how you said yes to this <laughs> panel, actually. Of course, I love it here. I, I wonder, have, have you felt a, a bit of weight as, as you are helping that person to navigate the morning, make getting the balance right of, of how much we talk about COVID-19, but how much we talk about all the other things. Yeah, and I don't think we have quite got the balance of the mm. human cost of this. And it came to me early on when I, I was looking up at the sky and thinking, God, we haven't seen a, a contrail, a, a, an aeroplane. Chemtrails. A chemtrail no. across. Like, That's incredible. I've noticed more birds, uh, but I haven't noticed any of those. I thought, gee, what a breather for the planet. You know, what a breather. But then I was with two friends. One was working in the arts and ran festivals around Australia and the other one um, was in Indonesia and he married a lovely Indonesian woman and they ran an ecotourism resort. And both of them had been severely affected um, by it. And they said, you know, our whole business is up in, up in the air. Like, we, my, I can't go home to visit my family. You know, it, it was everything that came, came. I went, this is, a so, this is going to be a huge social problem. And how I then uh, get people to navigate the social issues that will come out of this. I don't think we've even seen Oops. the start of those. No. Um, but that's when I went, oh, this is, a, this is bigger than the little, that little virus that's in, in us. You know, it's going to be really big. But I, I don't know. Wait and see. Well, Wait and see how I keep bringing those different, yeah. different angles. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned that a breather for the planet. I, I caught you out of the corner eye nodding yeah. furiously. <laughs> I mean, that is where you are squarely centred in the planet breathing. That's right. I think we're, we're talking about um, not giving people a breather from COVID-19 or not um, bashing people over the head with it all the time. We also have the same problem in climate change where we're just talking all of the time about the risks and the issues and um, the dangers. And we've lived through it, right, in, in Australia this year. Um, so I think a lot of the work that I do is talking about hope and climate hope and that what, what we can mm. do and how there are some technologies that are being developed that uh, can make a big dent and there are other, um, other behavioural changes that we can do um, as we go along. So I, I guess we have to be able to look at both of these really big issues together and uh, I think spreading a message of hope and he helping people to connect with each other is just so important right now. And I wonder, Sophia, do, where does climate hope sit in the, this idea about celebrating our small successes as we go along? Hmm. Well, just to put an Australian bent on it, and I'll just tell you a little bit about what I do, if that's okay. Of course. Um, so, um, 
I'm working in a like an emerging industry in Australia. It's called carbon capture and utilization. So we take CO2 from industrial sources or suck it out of the air and turn it into cements and plasterboards, fuels, all different kinds of um, products that can create new green and sustainable industries. And this is an alternative to you know taking the CO2 and um, burying it underground or uh, emitting it into the air and waiting for future generations to have to deal with it. Um, so these kinds of technologies are really important to support and have people choose to spend their careers and their time on to invest their money and their superannuation and all different, um, different ways of supporting technologies, but also um, spreading the word to people about um, that they exist. Um, so these small wins have been so important for us as an Australian technology helping to decarbonize Australian industry and the world because um, abundantly there's a lot of negativity being um, spread by the world press and by large emitting um, industries saying that business as usual is so important right now. We need a gas-led recovery and we, we need to bunker down and look at how to, um, how to secure our economic growth so we can get back to the way things were so that we can survive. But unfortunately, that's just not the way that, um, that it's going to work. We have to change the way that we do things, create a whole new business as usual and embrace circularity. And yeah. Yeah, you would definitely <laughs> agree yeah. with this. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the, the idea that the way it was being done before was good is a misnomer. I think that's absolutely not where it was. It was not great. And why would we want to go back to that? And so what, one of the things that we're trying to do um, in the carbon capture utilisation sector is um, spread the message that carbon dioxide is a resource. And if you think of it as something that you can turn into a valuable product, then we can unlock an unimaginable um, imaginable amount of innovation potential and we can be treating all of our wastes as new materials and embracing this fully circular economy. And to play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. is that a license to be emitting carbon? Absolutely not. <laughs> and I only ask that because oh, yeah, I heard right. you answer this question on Q&A and I, and I loved the response. So, Well, I mean, we need to reach um, no more than 1.5 degrees of warming. Um, and we've agreed to that in our Paris targets. So we, how are we going to get there? We have to go to 100% renewable electricity and we've made so many investments and so much progress along that way. But there are so many other industries that really do need to be decarbonized. We have all of our heavy industries, our um, cement makers, steel makers, glass makers, rubber, aluminium, all of these industries that are crucial to the way we live that need decarbonization pathways. We, it's not giving license to other industries to emit. We're creating pathways for all of the different parts of the economy that come together to reach our 1.5 degree targets. Furious not yeah. to agree, mate. Yeah. Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, look, this, uh, this, it's a real dichotomy, I think. There is a lot of despair. And I've been in the industry now for a, a, a long time. And it is hard sometimes to keep that, uh, yeah, the hope going. I, I think, you know, and the, the start of the year was really challenging. The, the, the fires and the smoke and, and that, that's like a, a very real and present happening. It, it's not 20 years in the future, it's, it's now. Mm. And, you know, in some ways that situation was a bit of a, a boon for our industry at least because people were suddenly going, all right, yeah, it, it's real. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, how about that? <laughs> yeah, I didn't see that coming. No. <laughs> Who knew? And, yeah, I, I discovered I'm allergic to smoke and so spent, I think, the whole of January hidden inside the house, full, you know, P, what is it, N25 mask on, couldn't go outside, just, uh, and, you know, apologies for the earlier coughing, don't have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> something obviously it's our social norm to yeah. need to explain yeah. those things Sorry. now and uh, but i think it's it's 
it's kind of, in, in some ways, it's given us um, the, the kick up the bum that we probably need. I think, you know, Greta Thunberg has has definitely raised the profile, but we're all now experiencing the outcomes of us not doing all the things that we should have been doing a long time ago. And COVID is just one more of those things. We've had fires, we've had hail, and and COVID is part of that. It's not just a, a you know some random thing that just happened. It's part of our ongoing practice of not of treating the planet like our own sewer and. This is what happens. It's it's not a you know it's not a mystery. Mm. At least this is a topic you've been talking about for decades. You've been in TV shows. I think it was called Carbon Cops. Yep. <laughs> quite a big thing. No, I was quite a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. it was. I was Craig Rucastle before. Uh, before, yeah, before, before Craig yeah. caught up. <laughs> I mean, how do you feel that we're we're still having the same conversations? Oh, so frustrating, and I can't yeah. imagine. But working in it, it's Groundhog Day. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. that that this just keeps coming around, yet nothing's done. I remember when we did Carbon Cops oh, 2007, uh, we were saying, government, it's a big ship. We were making apologies. It's a big ship to turn around. To, so y- you can do something. Draft proof. I'll tell you how. Yeah, and you won't have smoke next time it comes <laughs> around. Dra- like all these little things that the individual could do was the individual's responsibility. We said because government... it. They're working on it. Sure, they're working on it, but it's a big ship to turn around. So how many more years later? This year, I spoke to Craig Rucastle, who's just done his Fight for Planet A. He was still uh, talking about the individual action and what we can do, but actually, I think we need the the big, the top of the tree to be doing rather than all the seeds underneath. So there, it's, it's there incredibly will, There will be a time when, when we can no longer turn the ship around, to use your Oh, analogy. absolutely, yeah. Like we're, we're running, very close, we're very running out of time, aren't we? Yeah. We are, yeah. We have until 2030. I think it's even... We're turning? Uh, is anyone at the helm? Yeah. Is anyone driving? <laughs> who's the captain? I don't know. Yeah, who's the captain? <laughs> L- Lauren, <laughs> you, you and I were working in, in Parliament 10 years ago. You'd been there much longer than when I sorted in briefly. Well, that makes me sound really old. So <laughs> thanks, Dan. I, my next line was going to be, you are very young, <laughs> offensively young when you're working. There. But you were there for, for what's become a bit dubbed the carbon wars. Oh my God, yes. Uh, how, how do you reflect on that time and that, that now, a decade later, it, it feels like we've come full circle and we're, we're at the base point, although perhaps slightly elevated? Yeah, and it's funny because... Um, it actually, I think it actually links with COVID here in that yeah, 10 years ago, we had the whole, you know, ditch the witch carbon tax rallies. And they, you know, I covered so many of them. People were feral, like feral mm. at these things. Um, interestingly, that is where I learned about flat earthers. And gosh, aren't they cute? <laughs> <laughs> they are the funniest people. I just... They were at every rally and I just was always so fascinated with them. Um, And I think that's where my fascination with conspiracy theorists started. And look, we're we're, we're back here again. We'll we'll get to that in a minute too. Um, But yeah, I think it's just that, you know, it shows and it's mirrored here with COVID that there are the experts who keep saying, this is how it is. This is what we need to do. This is how we manage it. And then I think sometimes there's, I actually worked um, for a little while as a media advisor for the Climate Commission. And (laughs) that's where I learned that there are the people who understand things and are trying to do things. And then there is everybody else. And the vast majority of those people don't want to hear it. They just don't want to hear it. And they think that they're being tricked or they think that there's some ulterior motive to the whole conversation or they think um, that, you know, their whole world is going to change and they they just don't want to engage in the conversation. And, you know, I spend a lot of time on social media and, and I, I did back then as well. And people just get rabid about anything where the government is trying to tell them that something's important or, you know, when the science community comes out and tries to tell them something's important, that's when all of a sudden these loud voices come out and try to drag down the science of things. It's, it's a baffling thing and I don't know how we bridge those two groups. Well, you mentioned there that there's a, perhaps a connection with COVID-19 and, and has that been the kind of forced 
blunt and abrupt change to the way we live? Yeah. The tone of conversations on social media right now horrify me. They terrify me. People are so angry and so Mm -hmm. worked up and so um, reactive to anything. I could literally go onto Instagram and say like, good morning, everybody, and somebody would attack me for it because the way I said it was wrong or, you know, oh, it's a good morning for you because you're not in lockdown. And it's like, oh, God, like you cannot speak because people are just losing it. They're losing it. And I think it is... Um, just that they have no control over what's going. They don't have an explanation, so they're trying to come up with their own explanation for what it is. Um, they they think that everybody's lying to them or their secrets or, you know, they think Pete Evans has got all of the answers or <laughs> it's just a terrifying... Well, you've been dealing with conspiracy theorists, haven't you? Oh, my God, yeah. And you, but you stare them down. Because they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they're just... What they're saying doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, when, and when you have worked in politics and they're trying to you know intimate that the government is behind this huge master plan and you're like I've worked with politicians they are not smart enough to do this I don't think that far ahead (laughs) they are not competent not in this election cycle They, they, they can't do their basic jobs let alone a master plan to control our minds also if they were controlling our minds wouldn't we all just vote for them like why do they have to spend so much time trying to convince us that they're the good guys um also they would all have to get along with each other and we know that even within a party they hate each other they're fighting they're leaking information like every time someone farts they will leak it to the media and they seem to think that the government is all working together labor and liberal the coalition the nationals they're all working together and keeping the secret and they're like in it together and clearly don't understand project management (laughs) do you know how many (laughs) public servants have contacted me saying you are so right we can't do anything like it would take six months to get approval just to run a conspiracy plan like (laughs) have a strategy session what's the best conspiracy plan to develop we'd still be in meetings about the best way to do this and how do we manage the social you know the optics of the whole thing and finance would want to be in on it because who's going to pay for it yes someone was like we don't have money for pens let alone you know how like trafficking Mm. children in tunnels under melbourne like this is It's wild that it it makes me feel like saying, just watch the news a little bit. Watch what our politicians are doing. And if you think they're capable of doing this, you need to watch a little bit longer. That's right. 30 minutes, 7 p.m. most nights. (laughs) I I can say with authority that's a good place to start. (laughs) Leisha, on that point, obviously we're making light of a component of it, but have we lost the ability to politely disagree? Communication. I think that it's all about the communication here and I just don't think we'll ever get it. I look at the way we're communicating the science around COVID and we are 100% all behind the scientists for the vaccine. Like that is everything is pinned on this vaccine. And if you look at the history of vaccines, Mm. it's a pretty fraught business making getting a vaccine. I'm even scared to say the word vaccine yes. <laughs> the lashback I yeah, get. that's right yeah. that's right so uh, while I say everybody's got this thing on the vaccine you know there's a lot of people who haven't got yeah. the thing on the vaccine we have so much faith in in um, the science community to bring this together then we have with the climate the climate discussion so much distrust of the science community to give us that same information so for a start that the communication of what we choose to believe I think also just um the the niceties i don't know i try to stay off it stay off social Smart. media mm. um just to because to navigate it mm. is to yeah you've got to be in, a part of it and you open yourself up to and i certainly am a part of it hopefully on on because on, radio feels a bit one way sometimes i'm in there and i have haven't seen a, another human being apart from my producer all day and you're talking out you you're constantly putting out but it's very hard to know what people um, are mm. coming back and so but generally yeah I think we are getting nastier I think the communication just how we communicate with each other is of absolute importance and I think too I don't know why the anger has come it's, uh, there's obviously some deep 
psychological thing going on It's been on there, a very noticeable shift. Yeah. So, I, you know, I get hundreds of messages from people every single day. And last year, you know, you'd occasionally get somebody who was really rude and be like, oh, okay, calm down. But now it's sort of every second or third message. Really? Just people being really blunt and sort of just Nasty. completely forgetting their how manners. Do, how and do you deal with that? Because, I mean, it's not, no one likes to see terrible things said mm. about them, to them. Yeah, it's not, it's not fun. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously getting a lot better at it, but sometimes I just don't read the messages because I don't want to. <laughs> mm. And when we, if we're having that inability to be able to politely disagree, what does that mean for having the big conversation about where we're going? I, I've been practicing quite a lot talking to people who don't agree with me. I think a good thing to practice. Mm. We all we all have these bubbles that in our friendship groups and our extended family where we just have this feedback loop of the things that we say and think. Uh, so I've been really, I'm from far North Queensland. Uh, there's a lot of people um, where I come from who uh, don't necessarily agree with some of the technologies that I work on. Right. But I love and respect those people. And so I quite often will go back and talk and understand why people don't, so I think often it's not trusting the science and not listening. Um, and I, I practice it all of the time. And quite often you don't, you're never going to convince somebody of something, but you might convince them to come one step in your direction. And that's also a win. Yeah, absolutely. I believe. Yeah. yeah. You have to go one step in their direction as well. Sometimes I'm, I'm open take to... take smaller steps. Yeah. <laughs> I'm open to examining my own biases. I don't. I mm. think that we're all constantly evolving works of art, and we um, sometimes we can be stuck in some feedback loops. And yeah, I I'm definitely not hard and fast on any one thing. But I think at the at the end of the day, with the climate change um, movement and the fact that people are listening to scientists when it comes to COVID, and not so much when it comes to climate change. We have these crazy incentives built into our system that mean that people are um, people are incentivized to keep doing things the way that they were done, um, even though lots of technologies emit lots of CO two into the atmosphere. It's still cheaper to do so, and ten percent around ten percent of the world's GDP is spent on fossil fuel subsidies. Now, while the world's governments know that we have 10 years before we reach a point, a tipping point, we're still incentivizing fossil fuel industries to be the, the primary source of, of fuel. It's just crazy. And so um, a lot of those vested interests are feeding misinformation back into our system. And so, and people, and they're smart and they're really good at it. And so people are sitting there mm. on social media, um, flicking through and getting misinformation and it's really scary and sad yeah yeah and, and I, I guess having been in this area for a while the, the social media element is kind of new I'm still grappling with all of that you know in the early days when we were I would go into an organization mostly go, local government at that point and there were people who just said this is ridiculous why are we doing this and so you would have this conversation around, well, we can't keep using the world's resources at the rate that we have done. We can't. That's, that's, that's economics. Mm. Yes, it's science too, but it's actual just fact. If, if you were running your own household like that, you would be in serious debt. How, how can we not... We can't keep doing that for the services that the planet gives to us. It's... it's ridiculous that's physics why would we continue that it, we can't keep emitting we can't keep treating the planet like our own sewer and and then and kind of expect that that will continue to be okay it just won't so do people often ask you well, what can i do as one person yeah constantly <laughs> excuse me and and i guess for me it uh, my answer is always start where you are. Mm. It, you know, for me, it's I, I wear, I choose the things that I put on my body as much as possible. You know, the, the recycled plastic glasses made in Australia, Dresden glasses. 
you you have power through mm. the ability to consume. Yep. So ask people, ask the the producer of that product, <clears throat> what is it made of? Where is it made? How is it made? Is it made in a factory? Goodness knows where in qualities and an environment that we don't know anything about. Then probably not. But do you think there's a stumbling block there where? First of all, the effects of climate change are in the future, so it's very intangible. So unlike COVID, which is here right now and it's affecting people right now, so people are like, oh, that's a tomorrow problem, not a today problem. And things like purchases, that requires an effort to research and go, and people just don't have the time or inclination to put that effort in. And it's like yeah. every single little thing you could do differently or you could just keep doing it the same way. And oh, absolutely. And hope yeah. that someone else does it. Yeah. And, and, and the world is now much more complicated. And, and certainly there are apps now, you know, you can check on a product, good on you is, is but one. But even of that them. requires someone um, to yep. do that, to actually look yep. when they're going to buy something rather than just go, that's the one I want. So I'm just going to get it. And, and, and you know, to, to that point, I think, at some point, we also need to be able to say, I want to be able to trust this product is made in the way that I would expect and, and want. It's made with low chemicals. It's made, however it is, in a way that is not harming people and planet. Does it need something like the heart tick or something, you know? I, I mean, po possibly. And I, and I guess that kind of gets across that that inability or you know our own laziness to to go and research and that is, stuff is that if only we had some way to embed into the cost of our products <laughs> gee oh, what wow. would that be i just can't when imagine it feels like a great privilege though i think mm. to, to be able to do that like i know you know you look around and you think we can probably majority of us here maybe afford to do research right. and find the the, the most ethical um, but for a lot of a lot of folk, I think they just the a the effort taken, but also the cost the cost involved. And, and it's an yeah. awareness thing first, isn't it? And, and having an understanding yeah, of yeah. what what the difference but is. But it is, does come from a position of privilege to go. Well, you could buy yeah, this completely. thing, which is yeah. you know eco friendly, yeah. or you could buy this thing that's you know seventy five percent cheaper. And for some people, there's no choice for them. They have to go for the cheaper yeah. item. They don't have the money yeah. to pay the extra. That's where government incentives absolutely come in. They need to make it more expensive to buy heavily polluting and um, and bad for. Isn't that um, price on carbon? Maybe <laughs> that is that is one. So that is one back, back to where we started. Yeah. We started from. Um, I, I feel like I could chat away all day with you, but I realise that we've just gone disastrously over time. And I want to get some. I want to get some time for some questions as well. So if you've got a question, I want you to throw your hand up, uh, please. And when the microphone comes to you, please stand up and say your name as well. Oh, we've suddenly now got a shy crowd. No one, no questions. This incredible, just over here, please. Hi, my name's Julie Hare and thank you to the panel for such an interesting discussion. Uh, Dan, I thought I'd throw this on to you and uh, oh. <laughs> when you were putting together this, I was wondering whether you thought about which book you would have brought along and why you would have brought it. Oh, I did. In fact, I brought it with me, but I was so en enamoured with the discussion we were having. It was how uh, the koala lost his tail about, about friendship and, and how a, a koala make, made uh, the kangaroo do all the digging to get to the water and then consumed it all uh, and then had his tail ripped off for his troubles. So <laughs> a salutary tale about uh, friendship and, and working together, I think, and, and perhaps uh, as it pass, uh, comes back to here, not drinking all the water when someone else has done all the digging. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's a good one. Do we have another question? Yeah, just at the back, please. So I, I believe that at, at this time we haven't achieved nothing at all in sustainability, that there's been an awareness of the issue and, uh, um, and, and people wanting to do something for many years. And CSIRO has been publishing books um, years ago. Uh, so, so I just wanted to ask the panel for a perspective on how, how much you think we have achieved in the last 15 to 20 years. Good question. Mm. I can probably start on that. I think despite the rhetoric and despite the, the conversation that was a little bit on the disappointing side, I suppose, we, we have come a long way. We know 
we know that we can make changes. You know, we know, for instance, we know how to design a house that is passive solar. I think we should do more about actually implementing that, but that's a whole other conversation. We know, for instance, how to make green ceramics. We know how to capture energy from the sun and transport it to neighbouring family, you know, households and businesses. Those are all things that have really increased our ability to live more lightly on the planet. We now have electric cars. Those are all amazing inventions that are, are comparatively new in our history. And I think we absolutely know what we need to do. We know how to do it. What we're lacking is political will. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> yeah. taking... I can't agree with you more. I think we should we should definitely catch up after Hang this. On. <laughs> <laughs> so 15 years is an interesting frame that you've suggested because it's been around 15 years since I started university. And uh, I studied international business uh, at ANU. And when I first started, I was always interested in corporate social responsibility and how to harness uh, corporate spending to achieve um, social and environmental goals. And uh, that wasn't even an option to focus on for a degree. It was effectively a week in one unit of one semester at uni to study pretty much business ethics. Um, we've seen an unbelievable change in what's being offered to, for training and for uh, people who are coming up and wanting to enter the job market who want to solve some of the, these big sustainability problems and create uh, new technologies. But um, I think the biggest change and the most heartening change that I'm starting to see, but we've got a long way to go, is the fact that um, I'm starting to be... I went to Davos this year to the World Economic Forum uh, and I was able to talk to pretty much any of the world's business leaders that I wanted to about what their sustainability focuses and um, their ambitions were. And the reason that I got to go is because uh, the World Economic Forum recognised that they are male, pale and stale. And uh, <laughs> all of the yep. most important decisions in the world are being made by white men who look the same, looking at each other going, yeah, we're doing the right thing. So um, they effectively want to get more young, young people, women and people of colour into boardrooms and into positions of power. And um, that has to start somewhere. And so they sent 50 young people from around the world to go there. And, but this is a multi-pronged approach that is happening in all different world stages. And so um, really this is going to, I think that this can, the sustainability issue can be achieved with having way more women in leadership and way more diversity in mm. leadership because we're in an echo chamber and, it, and the only way to change that is to have uh, diversity of voice and leadership. I look forward to when you become the uh, independent <laughs> member of the House, the Senate, who has the balance of power and then has all, ba ba able to make decisions on values and hold the uh, political parties to account. Uh, I just want to, if you want to weigh into this question about the 15 year mark, have we, what, if anything's been achieved? I think we're funkier. Um, the people in the industry are funkier than they were. It hasn't got this hairy green image anymore. <laughs> like the, the sort of the, the alfalfa sprout eating, sock wearing over Birkenstock shoe wear. You know, that, I think the fact that we've got this funky bunch here talking about it. And the, uh, to me, the, smart, the smarts wrapped around it. So for solar, for example, when the incentives came in to put solar on your roof, it was about um, making money. Really, everyone who was going to do it for the right reasons had done it. Uh, everyone then we had to get on board to do it for the smart reasons, the the money making reasons. So for whatever reason we have to incentivise, I think that's that's been a big driver in just getting people on board. Uh, the fact that you've got Atlassian, uh, you know, two billionaires just rolling in it, um, and yet um, mm. driving it, you've got Elon Musk. Don't quite. He feels like a bit of a Bond villain to me, <laughs> uh, but he's, he's certainly dri a driving force. We'll, we'll edit that yeah. out for defamatory yeah. purposes. <laughs> I think our kids are so aware. They, they give me so much hope because our kids yeah. are so aware. They teach it in kindy, you know, about 
you know, recycling and, and, and all, all about the planet. My kids know more about this stuff than I do. They come home and tell me, no, mum, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that. And you're like, oh, cool. All right. Thanks. I, you know, so I think it's just becoming part of their conversation. And so kids as young as, you know, five and six, but, you know, teenagers and stuff, this is, they really care about it. Mm. And so maybe the pale, stale and, um, what was it? Male, male. male no. pale and stale. <laughs> Once they give it up. Retire. And we can <laughs> That's <laughs> what Greta off. has done though. Greta has activated young yeah, people. Absolutely, yeah, and yeah. given them courage mm. to talk at the dinner table with their parents. Yes. Some of them are CEOs. and yeah. yeah. I think it's also about being given the space to step up and talk. Like you were given at Davos. Like if that hadn't have happened, they wouldn't have got your voice in the room if, if they're not if children are being taught about this and they're not having that equal discussion as well I wonder if we have uh, probably one time for one or two more questions if the panel is happy to go uh, over because sure. I, I kind of blame you for all for running us <laughs> over so much uh, any other questions oh wow that wasn't as interesting as I thought then. <laughs> Here I thought it was amazing, an amazing chat. Come on, there must be one. Or, no, all right. Well, perhaps just before we wrap up, Lauren, we've been talking about some, some of the big vexing challenges. I understand that you've got an even bigger one coming up, organising a birthday party for a one-year-old. It's tight. I'll cry. <laughs> oh, no, that's not the purpose. Yes. So, so tell us about that because part of what has made you such a hit on social media is I think the, the bluntness with which you're able to talk about uh, the, the reality of life of being a mum. In fact, I had a friend of mine get in touch with me after you posted on social media about us and she was enamoured that we knew each other and then said, actually, you're both a bit wild, so I get it. <laughs> but I said to her, what is it, what's the thing that, you know, that makes her connect? And she said that you make it feel okay for her not to be a perfect mum all the time. That's really nice. What does that say to you about, you know, as much of the trolling that you get and that, I mean, that's the other side, isn't it? Knowing that actually you can Oh yeah, the, the beautiful comments and, you know, the supportive people like that far outweigh the negative. And I read a great quote the other day that said, you know, being hated by some is the key to being loved by others. And, you know, I'm, I'm okay with not being, you know, the perfect step, Stepford wife and annoying some people if it means that I make it easier for, for some who, yeah, sometimes being on social media can be very overwhelming. You tend to compare with other people and when you think everybody's doing it so much better than me or so much neater or, you know, or so much happier, then... Um, it can start like it happens to me as well. I, I look at people who are doing amazing things and think, cool, like it's 11 and I'm still in my pajamas. So, you know, sometimes you really want to see somebody else going, this is rubbish. And yeah, last night I had a, a I always try to do a big first, day, first birthday for the kids because it's mainly for me. Like, hooray, we survived the first <laughs> year. Um, and their second and third and fourth, they don't need to be very exciting. Um, <laughs> So I like to do, and for the photos, so I can show them, see, I celebrated you, there you go. Um, but I had this moment the other day where I was like, why do I, this is my third child, why do I do this to myself? Because this is the worst time to try to get anything done. Mm -hmm. Every time I move, she's trying to pull stuff out of cupboards and climb me and whinging and like just destroying everything I do. And she won't nap unless I'm holding her. So I get to do about one task a day. Um, so the party may or may not be a spectacular failure <laughs> we shall wait and see but it, but it will be the it, will, it will happen whether it's good or not yes yeah. well we'll look forward to seeing that uh, on your social media Thanks. thank you very much thank, thank you to you. all of the panel ladies and gentlemen please give it up for the panel this afternoon thanks dan Lauren, Lish, Zafia and Kate. So wonderful to have them here with such a wealth of insights. You can find out more about what's happening with Floriad Reimagined on the website. Thanks very much for your company. Yeah, take care.